Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing for Balchem, and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth installment of Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series. Today's Real Science webinar is titled The Benefits of Mitigating Heat Stress in Dairy Cows with Dr. Lance Bumgard from Iowa State University. Dr. Bumgard, the floor is now yours. Thanks, Scott. I want to thank Balkem for giving me the opportunity. Okay, so I just want to give a, sh a quick shout out to a longtime collaborator and good friend, uh, Rob Rhodes. Rob uh, is a professor at Virginia Tech University. He and I were at Cornell together, and uh, we were both on faculty at Arizona together. And almost all of our heat stress stuff we've been working on, we've been working on as a team. Okay, so. Uh, this may seem strange to start off a heat abatement talk about the gut, but we'll, I'll, I'll, I hope you'll follow along with me. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the gut here eventually, but um, you know, the idea that uh, an unhealthy intestine or an unhealthy gut is the epicenter of, of an animal's overall health is not new, right? So uh, you'll see in a second how we whittle our way down to the gut during heat stress. But, but like I said, if, if you've if, if you ever experience any type of gut problems, and a huge percentage of, of you know, adult population do, you'll understand why if the gut's not healthy, the, the animal's not healthy. Just a quick reminder of what the gut is, the GI tract, uh, the gastrointestinal tract, is a tube running from the mouth to the anus. And technically, everything, everything inside that tube remains outside of the body. So that means the breakfast you just had a few hours ago, most of it is remaining outside of your body. It takes a couple hours, two or three hours before those nutrients are absorbed. It's not until the animal uh, that those, the food stuff is absorbed that actually becomes part of you, right? So, uh, and we as nutritionists and veterinarians oftentimes think of the GI tract primary job is to digest and absorb valuable nutrients. And, Clearly, that's an important job. Um, but if you're a strict immunologist, you'd probably argue that a more important job of the GI tract is to keep unwanted molecules from entering or infiltrating into the body. Most of the things inside of a person's GI tract or an animal's GI tract, they don't want in, right? Uh, parasites, pathogens, enzymes, acids, etc. If these things infiltrate the barrier of the gut, they have an opportunity to stimulate the immune system. And here's just a, a, a cartoon of what uh, the villi structures look like. Of course, these villi, um, their, their intent is to markedly maximize the surface area of the gut. And there might be oh, thousands of different cells that are lining this particular villi, okay? And because of this uh, strategy the animals use to maximize the surface area of its gut, um, it, 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 it really does increase the, the size of the, the surface area. And, and, and two other epithelia that all animals have are, are the skin. And I'm just using the skin as a reference because I think everyone has a good idea of how much surface area of skin there is. This is a human example now. There's about two meters squared uh, of surface area in a human, human skin. The lungs, uh, you know, because of the alveoli of the lungs, there's uh, substantially more surface area of the lungs compared to the skin. But because of these modifications in the structure of the gut, the mucosal folds, the villi, and the microvilli, the surface area of a human's GI tract is about 150 times that the size of the skin. Right? That's an enormous uh, increase in surface area. Now this is again a human example. So you can imagine then how much larger the surface area of, of the gut, of a ruminant's gut is. Right, because obviously the, the pre-gastric fermentation compartments, this number might be 10,000 times the size of, of the skin surface of a cow. I, yeah, I don't know. But regardless, it's, it's an enormous number. And again, if you're looking at the, a, a human's GI tract, if you laid down the GI tract and, and flattened its surface area out, it would be about the size of a doubles tennis court. So remember all those, there's uh, the pathogens, antigens, et cetera, that are in the gut. In fact, you have you have more microbes in your gut than you do cells of your body. So, you know, the, the old joke about who's really the host and who's really the, um, the parasite here is, is, is clear, right? And, and because of all these microbes, even, even the non-pathogenic ones, if they infiltrate into the body, they're gonna stimulate an immune response. So it's not surprising then that a, a majority of the immune system evolved um, from the gut, 
even in the most simplest of creatures, their, their immune system mostly resides in their gut. And still today, over 75% of an, of an animal's immune system resides in the gut. It's because it's massive, right? And it's constantly exposed to potential pathogens. Now my group, uh, today we're gonna to be talking about how heat stress initiates leaky gut and the consequences of that. Uh, we've since then extended the biology of, of leaky gut to looking at the transition period and feed restriction and high gut acidosis. Um, and we're just now starting to look at mycotoxins. We're not going to talk about these other uh, insults to the gut. We're also very interested in calcium metabolism, but we're going to focus in today on, on how heat stress uh, initiates leaky gut and how that leaky gut then influences the immune system, metabolism, and the hormonal system, and ultimately how it produ reduces productivity. A very quick review, though, um, of, of metabolism. An animal that's on ad libitum feed intake and gaining weight What's, what's from a dairy perspective, let's, um, let's use the cow that's 200 days in milk as our example. She's in a positive energy balance. Um, she's ad libitum fed. Insulin levels would be high. Okay, that's, that's the hormone that's reflective to, to feed intake. And because of the hyperinsulinemia, um, there's a decrease in non-esterified fatty acids. And so she's putting on condition. Insulin is very potent, lipogenic. Um, hormone and very potent anti-lipolytic hormone. So she's gaining weight, she's gaining condition, and the hormone that's primarily responsible for that is insulin. Now let's compare her to the animal that's suboptimal feed intake. For example, the cow that's at the 10 days in milk. Okay? She's only a week after calving. She, uh, she has the lowest levels of insulin in her entire lifetime will be during that short window of time. It's, it is this hypoinsulinemia that allows her to mobilize adipose tissue, not necessarily fine fatty acids go up. So she's losing body condition and she's losing body weight primarily because of the decrease in insulin. Okay, so that this is normal metabolism that I'm sure we all had to memorize back in back in nutrition class. And, you know, and the reason I'm emphasizing this is because you'll see how how there how different this is when when we're talking about heat stress. Okay. So also, just a very quick reminder of how important glucose is, especially to a lactating ruminant. So, um, glucose is the is primarily made from propionate. Of course, propionate is one of the volatile fatty acids coming out of the liver. So, um, this monosaccharide glucose is the precursor to lactose. So, this is milk sugar. This is a, a disaccharide. And the reason why this is important is because the amount of lactose made. Uh, determines primarily determines the overall milk yield. In other words, lactose is the primary osmotic regulator of milk yield. So the more lactose an animal makes, uh, the more milk she'll she'll provide. And we know that it takes about 72 grams of glucose to make one kilogram of milk. So if anything disrupts this pathway, either back here in the rumen, or if anything uh, reprioritizes the use of glucose other than the mammary gland, it has the opportunity to cause cause milk production. Okay, so obviously we're all interested in heat stress for a variety of reasons, uh, animal welfare being, being key. But yeah, the other reason, of course, is economics. And the dairy industry is very sensitive to heat stress, um, the most of all the animal agri agriculture industries, at about $1.7 billion a year. Globally, I've read estimates that up to $500 billion a year. It's hard to wrap your head around um, and even hard to calculate, obviously. It'll get worse in the future, so it's already a huge problem. I want to emphasize that. It's already a massive economic problem. It'll get worse in the future if climate change continues. Even if climate change is not going on, even, even if climate change doesn't continue, heat stress will become more of an issue in the future because of how um, what our genetic selection continues to emphasize. All of the, all the phenotypes that are economically important to us in animal agriculture, milk synthesis, lean tissue accretion, piglets per sow, et cetera. These are all heat producing processes. So um, the, the amount of heat an animal produces today, of our farm animals today, is substantially more than what it was 40 years ago. And, and um, the likelihood of our grandchildren's farm animals producing more heat than our current animals are is, 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 is almost certain. So in other words, um, the, the temperature at which 
a high producing animal becomes stress or heat stress is going to continue to go down. So we have to figure out what's going on and, and try to understand the biology of heat stress so we can implement mitigation strategies. So one of the first experiments that Rob and I did at Arizona looking at uh, uh, heat stress was how much of the reduction in, in feed intake explains the reduction in milk yield. So in other words, all animals have a reduction in feed intake when they become heat stressed, right? And forever, um, we've always assumed that the reduction in feed intake explains why there's a drag in productivity during the summer. So we implemented a what's called a pair feeding experimental design. We we heat stress cows. Um, we record how much the, of a reduction in feed intake they have, and then we we pair feed a group of thermal neutral cows. So in other words, uh, these cows are remaining at 18 degrees centigrade, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and we only allow them to consume the same quantity of feed that the heat stress cows are consuming. So they're paired, right? They're paired to the heat stress. Okay, so uh, in this particular experiment, there's about a 30% reduction in, in feed intake. Um, and, and now all the, all the data I'm gonna show you for the rest of the uh, 45 minutes here is not confounded by differences in feed intake. They're, they're, they're the direct result of, of heat stress. So here's, here's the uh, pair fed cows. Remember the blue line is the thermal neutral cows consuming 30% less feed. There was a reduction in feed intake of about five kilos, right? Because they're eating less feed. But now only after about the first 24 or 48 hours, uh, these cows will implement homeoretic strategies to, max, to maximize milk yield, right? They're, they're put, they're here to make milk and they'll, they'll do everything in their power to do so. The heat stress cow, there's a, just a continuous and progressive decrease in milk yield for about six to seven days until it finally plateaus. So here's what we understand from this simple experiment is that all the area between these two lines has everything to do with just simply being heat uh, heat stress, right? And and by doing some some math, we know that about 50% of the reduction in milk yield during a heat wave is due to a reduction in feed intake. The other 50%, though, at this stage of the presentation, we don't know what explains that. What's causing this other 50%? And we've essentially spent the last 15 years of our lives chasing this down. So uh, as the name implies, heat stress, right? Stress is uh, uh, associated with the, the stress response you have, an increase in CRF and ACTH, and eventually an in increase in release of, of cortisol. And, and this is a, a dairy cow experiment where we saw about a, almost a 60% increase in, in cortisol. And of course, cortisol is a very catabolic hormone, right? It's responsible for breaking down different tissues. And not surprisingly, then um, animals during a, both animals, the pair fed thermal neutral and the heat stress animals, lose a considerable amount of body weight in that week or nine days of heat stress, right? Almost, almost 100 pounds of body weight loss in a week. So, this is a hypercatabolic uh, condition. And as you'd anticipate, when, you, when animals are in uh, thermal neutral conditions and consume 30% less feed and lose almost 100 pounds of body weight, their non-esterified fatty acid concentrations go up. So the, here's the uh, NEFAs on the y-axis, and of course, non-esterified fatty acids are a product of, of adipose tissue mobilization. The, the pair-fed cows will mobilize adipose tissue in an effort to spare glucose for the synthesis of milk. So this is, this is normal, this is 100% anticipated. The heat stress cows do not. And it turns out that there's a variety of models where heat stress animals just simply fail to mobilize adipose tissue, despite the endocrine profile uh, suggesting or predicting that they should, increasing cortisol, epinephrine, glucagon, et cetera. So these animals should be breaking down adipose tissue, but they don't. And again, this is conserved amongst a variety of species, ruminants, pigs, chicken, rodents, humans. Um, something is preventing adipose tissue mobilization during heat stress. Well, what's the most obvious um, exa uh, explanation? It's insulin. Strangely enough, despite the fact that animals go into negative energy balance, they lose body weight, and there's this hypercatabolic endocrine profile, there's also the strange increase in insulin. I want to emphasize that again. This is weird because the animal's gone off feed, right? 30, 40% reduction in feed intake. 
what's explaining this increase in insulin in, in dairy cows? Well, it turns out it happens in a, a variety of species. In fact, it's, I think it turns out it, it increases in, in every species ever e evaluated. Beef, pigs, rodents, rabbits, humans, hell, even snakes. When they become heat stressed, there's an increase in circulating insulin. Both basal and stimulated insulin response stimulated by a glucose tolerance test, the GTT. So this is a highly conserved response, and it's just really metabolically strange. Okay. Um, so the nice thing about dairy cows, of course, is that we can do an accounting of glucose every time we milk them. So we know that the pear-fed cows, or the, I'm sorry, the heat-stressed cows are secreting approximately 400 grams less lactose per day than the pear-fed controls. In other words, uh, there's almost a pound. Remember, there's 454 grams of glucose in a pound, and the heat-stressed cow is 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 um, secreting about a pound less of carbohydrates less than the pear-fed from neutral controls. So the question we had next was, okay, is the liver producing 400 grams less of glucose per day? Or is some other extra mammary tissue utilizing more glucose per day? So we, we utilized, um, we collaborated with a friend, Matt Waldron, and looked at using um, stable isotopes, looking at hepatic, uh, whole body glucose production. And I, I tend to get bogged down in the slides, so I'm, I'm not going to do that. But the main thing here is that the pair fed and the heat stress cows have a, a decrease in their capacity to make glucose compared to thermoneutral ad libitum conditions. But the important thing here is the decrease in glucose production is similar between the two between the two environments. So what does that tell us? It tells us that it's not the liver's fault. The liver's making glucose. It's it's responding to the gluconeogenic hormones, um, and and importantly, the hyperinsulinemia is not shutting down the hepatic glucose production. So th this we you know we discovered this back 10 12 years ago now, and so for a long time we assumed that the muscle was a was increasing its glucose consumption. Um, and I'm going to try to convince you now that probably the, probably the, the increased utilizer of glucose is, is the immune system. And, and to get an idea of why that there's an immune response during, during uh, heat stress, you got to understand how heat stress affects the gut. Okay, so every animal, when they, be, when they start to accumulate heat, including humans, um, vasodilates at the skin. That's why when you go to the beach or you go to the gym or you bail hay or whatever, you, when you start to become hot, your face gets red, your skin gets red. You're doing that because you, you're trying to vasodilate uh, and to maximize heat dissipation. Okay, but if you're going to have vasodilation at such a large tissue like the skin, you have to vasoconstrict somewhere else. If, if you didn't, you'd have, you'd die from low blood pressure, not getting enough blood back to the, to the heart. And the area of the body that vasoconstricts during heat stress is the gut. So you have this massive vasodilation at the, at the periphery of the skin, and then a, an equivalent amount of vasoconstriction going on at the gut. And you'll see then here in a second why there's multiple problems with that. And it turns out the, the epithelium of the gut is very sensitive to reduced oxygen delivery or hypoxia. Pinter's worth a thousand words. Now this is the ilium of uh, uh, ilium of a heat stressed pigs, but this is the thermal neutral ad libitum group where the ilium are long and slender. So this is a hallmark of a healthy intestinal barrier integrity. And the ilium of the heat stressed, you know, the villi are even hard to distinguish. So the, the, the damage is clear. Now, interestingly, from a just, sim just simply having a reduction in feed intake of only about 40% damages the gut. The villi becomes shortened and fatter. Okay, so I don't have time today to talk about how, how off feed events or inadequate feed intake can damage the gut as well, but it does. Um, so remember, I, I talked about trillions of, of, of microbes in the gut, and if they get in through the barrier of the gut, they'll stimulate the immune system. Well, one of the things that's in the gut is called lipopolysaccharide. And in a normal human, there's well over a gram of it in the gut. So there's probably many grams of it in, in, in the gut of a, of a cow. And 
in LPS, it's, it's made by gram-negative bacteria. It's outer membrane component of gram-negative bacteria. It, if it infiltrates a barrier like a scratch in your hand or your gut, it, 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 it simulates an immune response. And probably everyone on today's talk is familiar with being sick, right? You have reduced appetite, fever, muscle breakdown, you become lethargic, you get tired. Um, so, so, so LPS is what we use in the laboratory to stimulate uh, an immune response or try to model an immune, an immune response. Here's an oversimplified cartoon of what your gut looks like. Um, these are two enterocytes, and the enterocytes create and synthesize these proteins called tight junction proteins. There's a, a red where there's at least 50 different types of fight, uh, tight junction proteins. Now they're made obviously uh, within the cell, but they're embedded on the lateral side. And they reach out and they make a physical connection with their neighboring cells, tight junction proteins, and, and create almost like a a Velcro barrier, almost like a zipper, for example. E essentially, what it's doing is it's it's a gate for during the in this paracellular pathway that prevents LPS pathogens and other antigens from that are in the naturally in the lumen of the gut from getting in. Okay, but first, it, as it turns out, now we're learning more and more that any type of stress, even psychological stress, will cause these tight junction proteins to be pulled back into the cells that created them. They're still there, they're just not where they need to be. Now, this, you, know, you no longer have this physical barrier, and you get the infiltration of, of LPS, and, and undoubtedly hundreds, if not thousands, of different types of antigens will, will get in. Now, remember, most of the animal's immune system resides in the gut. So if the immune system doesn't, if the local immune system does a good job, um, you won't even know that you've had a leaky gut or you've had an infiltrating antigen. If the local immune system is unable to clear it, it travels via the portal blood to the liver. And the macrophages, the resonant macrophages in the liver, they're called Kupfer cells, will hopefully do a good job of detoxifying that, that arriving LPS. If the liver is unable to handle all the LPS that it's arriving, now the, the endotoxin goes systemic and the animal starts experiencing endotoxemia. Hell, it can even experience bacteremia. So it, that, what that means is that entire that entire bacteria can seep through this paracellular pathway, travel through the portal blood and get through uh, the liver and go systemic. Okay, so uh, the effects of, of heat stress on, on the gut are very quickly. This is jugular vein LPS. So on the X axis is time. And within two hours, you see this uh, notable, noticeable increase in circulating jugular vein LPS. The reason why I'm emphasizing jugular vein is because obviously, if you can pick up an increase in LPS in the jugular vein, your the, the local immune response of the gut has been overwhelmed, and so has the liver. Now, this, this, these animals are experiencing endotoxemia, and then not surprisingly, because you have this infiltration of antigens, uh, you you're having an immune response. These are two acute phase proteins. LPS binding protein and serum lamoid A and day of the heat stress on the x-axis. So when there's uh, heat stress, you get leaky gut, you have an infiltration of, of antigens like LPS, and you end up, getting, end up getting an immune response. Okay, pretty substantial immune response. So uh, at this stage of the talk, there's a the summary is that reduced feed intake only explains about 50% of the decrease in milk yield. There's a strange hyperinsulinemia. Um, the liver's not responsible for the problem. It's making the glucose. The glucose is just simply not ending up in milk. There's leaky gut. There's an immune response. And in reality, the biological consequences of heat stress um, aren't much different than uh, normal infection. Okay? And, and at this stage of the talk, we can't identify where this 400 grams of, of glucose has gone. So the gut becomes leaky. Right, and, and there's a variety of different models that demonstrate that, and you're probably asking yourself, okay, what's the big deal? What are the consequences of this, right? So to, to answer that, we need to have a good feeling of what's going on with insulin. Why, why is there, there this strange increase in circulating insulin during heat stress? And it happens, incidentally, this also happens during infection, sepsis, bacteremia, and we can very nicely model this increase in insulin by infusing LPS. So what, what would be insulin's role during heat stress? Well, a, a good friend of mine, when he's working with Tom Overton and Yves Beauclair, 
was was studying the consequences of of me me metabolic consequences of mastitis. This is Matt Waldron's work from his postdoc. So they infused LPS up the teep canal at time zero. The cow gets a fever, completely stops eating, and approximately two hours later, there's this insulin surge, which is strange, right? It's this is uh, the animal's got mastitis, severe mastitis. It's completely stopped eating. Why would the most anabolic hormone go up? Um, again, just a quick reminder how important glucose is. It takes 72 grams of glucose to make one kilogram of milk. And if anything reprioritizes the hierarchy of, of how glucose is used, it, it's going to cost or has the potential to cost milk. So that lead us, leads us to a guy named Otto Warburg. Otto Warburg was a, a professor in Germany, and he receives the 1931 Nobel Prize for identifying uh, a couple of things. One is that immune cells prior to be, sorry, cancer cells prior to becoming cancerous can burn a variety of different fuels. But once they become cancerous, they, they initiate this thing where they, they switch from oxidative phosphorylation, meaning they, they stop using the Krebs cycle, and they start generating their energy only from aerobic glycolysis, which is an inefficient system. Um, he, he also recognizes that immune cells are the same way. So immune cells, before becoming activated by an antigen, are quite metabolically flexible. They can burn a variety of different fuels. But once activated by an antigen, their preference becomes uh, glucose, and again, not through oxidative phosphorylation, but through aerobic glycolysis. And I'll show you a cartoon of that in a second. And so he wins the 1931 Nobel Prize. Three of his former PhD students go on to win Nobel Prizes. One of them was Hans Krebs, and he was also good friends with Albert Einstein. So this is an amazing man whose, whose influence on, on science is going on over a dec or a century now. So the Warburg effect essentially just demonstrates that you have a resting immune cell could burn a variety of different fuels. Here it's shown glucose coming in, going through glycolysis, two pyr pyruvate molecules coming down to the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle and generating efficient quantities of ATP. This is an efficient process, but a slow lumbering process. Now an activated immune, immune cell activated, for example, by LPS, um, has a very rapid increase in need of energy. And so it, it no longer has the flexibility of burning different fuels. It, it only wants glucose. And of course, it needs insulin to get this uh, rapid increase in glucose or uh, uptake of glucose. So this is, an an, this is not anaerobic glycolysis like we all had to memorize in biochemistry. This is, this is an aerobic glycolysis that is induced by an immune cell um, to generate rapid quantities of, of ATP. The net result then is this carbon is exported from the immune cell as lactate. And, and this explains then why an animal that's sick or has in some type of infection, it, it oftentimes has high levels of circulating lactate. Okay, so how much, right? How much glucose? Remember, it takes 72 grams of glucose to make one kilogram of milk. Well. This has been difficult because it's 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 very hard to uh, isolate and localize the immune system. Every tissue has resonant immune, even the brain has resonant immune um, cells. And to make matters worse, it it migrates, right? It might if you got an infection in your big toe, your immune system will mi migrate to the big toe. So you can't isolate it. So uh, attempting to quantify the glucose needs of an immune system requires you to do that at the organismal level. So we, we initiated this thing called an LPS euglycemic clamp, and it's a fancy word for essentially um, just infusing glucose. We give glucose at, or sorry, we give LPS at time zero. There's a couple hours of hyperglycemia. And this is, this hyperglycemia is because the liver's glucose output increases, uh, muscle and adipose tissue stop using glucose, peripheral insulin resistance. And these three systems outweigh immune system glucose utilization. But once the immune system gets fully engaged, and almost all immune cells do this, by the way, almost all leukocytes, um, now their glucose uh, utilization will outweigh the body's strategy to provide glucose for the immune system, and they become hypoglycemic. 
Okay, so we kind of thought, well, what if we just we can start infusing glucose the second she becomes hypoglycemic? Could we could we get a could we get a proxy of overall glucose use? So um, graduate student injects LPS on, into the jugular vein. We take blood samples. We measure the blood glucose levels, and as soon as she becomes hypoglycemic, we we start infusing glucose. We do this for 12 hours. We subtract off the controls, and it's approximately 1,000 grams of glucose, a kilogram of glucose in a 12-hour time frame, extrapolated to a day. We're talking two kilos. Two kilograms of glucose is an enormous amount of uh, of energy. Right? You're, here's a there's a 1.81 kilograms of of, of table sugar. And so this is an enormous amount of, of utilization of energy. And we've done this now in a variety of different species. And, and when, you, when you place the data on a metabolic body weight basis, it, I don't think it's surprising how similar then these, these, these data are. About approximately a gram of glucose per kilogram of metabolic body weight per hour. So remember back earlier when I said we, you know, we had heat stress cows, we're secreting about 400 grams less carbohydrates per day than the pair-fed controls. Well, right, the cow gets heat stress, it gets leaky gut. Leaky gut stimulates the immune system. The immune system now is the number one priority. And, um, and they start, and the immune system starts to utilize glucose. And the mammary gland is just no longer high in the totem pole. Okay, so what can we do about it? Right, what what can the feed and animal health industry do to to fix leaky gut and, and, and heat stress? Well, there are a variety of different targets: um, increasing feed intake, direct actions at the intestine, and we'll talk more about some of these diet uh, dietary strategies here in a second. But by far the biggest impact a producer can do is heat stress abatement. Right, physically modifying the the environment is is by far, I can't emphasize that enough, um, the best investment of money. And I've, I've just kind of listed them here, shade, fans, soakers, and misters. And, and so, so what are the benefits from investing in cooling? Well, I think I, I would assume most people have a good, fairly good feel for this already, but obviously for improved production, efficiency and profitability, uh, summer fertility is a huge issue, probably 50% of the decrease in, in the economic Consequences of heat stress are, are, are poor reproduction, welfare, health, sustainability, right? And so what would the priorities of, of heat stress be? Well, I'll show you here in the next slide, but solar, radiate, solar radiation is, is um, incredibly intensive. I'll just show you some data to, to prove that I think most people know that. And the second then would be to utilize evaporative cooling, uh, of course, while incorporating fans. So this is very old data now, right? 70, 70 years. But um, this is just simply looking at black dirt surface temperature. This is data from Nebraska. Black dirt surface temperature during the middle of a July day. So um, in the sun, no shade. At four o'clock in the afternoon, the, the, temperature, the black dirt temperature was 153 degrees. And just simply providing five minutes of shade will markedly reduce the temperature of that ground. So the emphasis here I'm just trying to show you is um, the power of shade, right? I think everyone probably has familiarity with that already, but um, just simply providing a small amount of shade can markedly reduce the, the thermal load on, on an animal. The other one I just want to talk about quickly is evaporation. And uh, I, I don't want to freak you out and remind you about physics, but um, the amount of energy needed to evaporate water is enormous, right? 540 calories to evaporate a gram of water going from 100 degrees Celsius into steam. Well, this explains why steam burns are so are so dangerous, right? Because there's so much more energy in the steam than there is in the hot water. Um, and so, so let's. Well, incidentally, there's also uh, energy liberated during condensation. So the same thing is true going both directions: one evaporating or vaporizing water, and the other one is is uh, 
condensation. And we'll give you examples of that both here in, in a second. But so the evaporation is a cooling process. I've already talked about the quantity of energy needed to evaporate water. And this explains then a variety of, of things that we all have familiarity with, right? When you get out of a swimming pool, it might be 100 degrees and you still get chilly. Or when you get out of your shower, before you got in your shower, you weren't cold. But now when you're coming out of the shower, you're cold. Well, why is that? It, it's because when, when you're wet and you're walking out now of the, of the pool or your shower, the water that's on your skin evaporates. And the energy required to evaporate that water is, being, is coming from the thermal energy on your body or in your body. So the water evaporates, the energy required to make it evaporate is coming out of you. So you're, that's, that evaporating water is literally sucking energy, thermal energy, out of your body. Okay. Um, this also then explains why it's warmer to stay in the shower, right? You get out of the shower. No, not, I mean, you shut off the shower. Why is it warm inside the shower? Well, because that water that was vaporizing during your shower is now starting to condense. And condensing liberates heat. Right, so I, I, we talked about the opposite, right? Cond uh, condensing water liberates heat. That's why it stays warm inside your shower, even after you shut off the water. And when you get out, that water's evaporating off your skin. That's why you get cold. Others examples are, for example, blowing on hot coffee. What you're doing when you're blowing on hot coffee is, is changing the gradient of the temperature, allowing that uh, the energy then to, to, to vaporize that water is coming from the thermal energy in the coffee. So when you blow on water and you see the steam, or sorry, hot, hot coffee, and you see the steam or the vapor leaving the coffee, the energy required to vaporize that is coming from the thermal energy of the coffee and the temperature of the coffee then goes down. And I'm, I'm emphasizing this, everyone, because I think everyone, everyone has familiarity with the power of evaporative cooling. Sometimes you just don't wrap your head around or think about, think about it. So the three ways to, to utilize the evaporative cooling is to cool the cow. In, in this particular strategy, you're literally putting water on, on the cow's skin and evaporating it off, right? And again, the evaporation of that water uh, on the surface of the cow, the, the energy required for that is coming from the body temperature of the cow and the cow becomes cool. Cooling the air, this is a, a strategy that's oftentimes utilized in, in more arid climates like Arizona. Right where you, uh, the producers there will sh will will, sh will um, introduce very tall, very small droplets of water around the cow. That wa that that water will evaporate, hopefully before it hits the ground. And again, the energy required to evaporate that droplet of water is is coming from the air temperature in this particular example. And now the air temperature has gone down because the energy has gone into evaporating that or vaporizing that water or some type of combination of, of, of the two. Um, I got this uh, slide from John Smith, gave, the late John Smith gave me this slide and a couple, actually a couple of the others. Uh, priorities to reduce heat stress. Uh, obviously, cows will increase their water consumption when hot. Um, to provide shade, we, we talked about why that is. And importantly, don't forget about the dry cows. I'll show you some data here in a second about um, dry cow cooling. Utilize evaporative cooling. And even in relatively humid climates like Iowa and the, the Northeast and Northwest, um, evaporative cooling is remains remains effective. At, not clearly as effective as, as in more arid climates or low humidity climates, but it remains effective. Fans are, are can utilize to uh, um, to dissipate heat and also to increase evaporative cooling. Minimizing distance to the parlor, holding pen is almost always the spot on dairies where cows get the hottest. Improve ventilation and where to do it, you know, long story short, if you can afford it, everywhere, right? If you can. So the summary of heat stress abatement, uh, providing good shade, Utilizing evaporative cooling, um, more water the better. And, and the, the the frustration I get from, the, I can hear the frustration oftentimes from producers. Well, I have to have to get rid of this water. 
Now, in part of this evaporative cooling is utilizing, you know, is managing the evaporative cooling to, to try to minimize wasting water. But, and again, also, I don't know, you know, what the cost of water is in, in everyone's systems, but don't forget about the dry cows. I'll show you data here in a second and try to measure it. If you're going to invest in cooling, try to uh, get some metrics that allow you to, to, to recognize that your investment's paying off. So this is some, some data from Dennis Armstrong, um, who was on faculty at University of Arizona uh, when I first got there, and he's a legend in, in heat stress abatement strategies. He was working with um, dairy farms in Saudi Arabia. And so they, here, let me, three different dairy farms over here in the far left column. And they were um, heat stressing, they were cooling dry cows or not. That's the only treatment. Okay, so the, in the dry period, cows are either cooled with shade and evaporative cooling or they weren't. And then once they calved, all cows were cooled. And um, these are just different metrics of, of reproduction. And in, in all, metrics and in all three dairies, the cows that were cooled pre-calving had improved metrics of, of reproduction. And, and on the far right, I'm sorry, is, is culling because of reproductive purposes. So, so clearly the, the, the benefits of cooling a dry cow extend far into lactation. Bob Collier and others were also uh, looking at the biology of this at the University of Florida. And, and Jeff Dahl and those guys are, are also extending that. So there are marked improvements, future improvements. We're talking 60 to 100 days following that cooling on, on reproduction. So, you know, I'm a Star Wars guy, but I, I just hope now everyone has a, a, good, a good feeling for just how powerful evaporative cooling can be. Um, even in climates that are, that are relatively humid, Evaporative cooling, if managed correctly, is, is still a very good use of, of invested money. Some diet, some management strategies. I already talked about reducing the distance from from the from the, from the parlor. The holding pen is where cows get packed in like sardines. They become stressed. Consider exit lane cooling. Um, I think that's a good strategy. Try not to lock up during the middle of the day. A good friend of mine short feeds. So if, if you can know when a heat stress is heat wave is coming, short the cows about five percent of feed on the day before, and then the, on the day of heat wave they have a they're aggressively eating. Um, that also requires quite a bit of management. Uh, feeding later in the night, early in the morning, push up feed often. You know, if you put your hand in the feed and it's hot, they're not going to eat it. And I understand a producer's reluctance to throw it away, but um, you know, hot, moldy feed, fermenting feed is not, they're not going to eat it. Try to avoid vaccinations during the middle of the day. Of course, that's vaccinations are accompanied by a small febrile response and at least provide shades for the, for the dry cows, if not some evaporative cooling. So dietary strategies, right? These are uh, mostly, I think, theoretical. I have a hard time studying these at the university, but um, low heat increment diets, trying to save your best forage for the warm summer months. Fat, I, I, there surprisingly not as much research on dietary fat as you'd think, but most of them do show some type of improvement of increasing uh, fat content of the diet. And of course that's because the digesting absorption of fat is, is accompanying with low amounts of heat, a balanced amino acid profile, and with regards to supplements, I think there's a variety of things and different strategies, right? Um, I, I haven't even talked about how heat stress causes rumen acidosis, but modifying rumen, rumen environment, uh, supplements aimed at improving gut integrity, feed intake stimulation, immune modulation. The one I want to talk about today is the vasodilators. Okay, when I was at Arizona, uh, Bob Collier was leading an effort looking at how nice and effective um, heat stress in dairy cows, and his, his PhD student was Rosemary Zimbelman. And so the first experiment they looked at, I think this was 12 grams of niacin a day, 
And this is vaginal temperatures of, of heat stressed cows when they were in the controls are in black and when they were fed the niacin, uh, it was in the open gray, open gray, open, this uh, open gray, I don't know what to tell these call this. Anyway, this is, these are the animals that were fed the niacin. So there was a substantial increase, sorry, decrease in, in body temperature when they were fed the, the niacin. And Bob did another experiment looking at a dose response. Um, that particular experiment did, didn't reproduce the, the body temperature uh, data, but they, they did see a linear increase in, in water consumption with increasing doses of, of, of niacin. Um, and then Bob did another ex experiment looking at the molecular consequences of, of, of um, betaine and niacin. And interestingly enough, um, and I'm not going to get through all the, the heat shock proteins in, in all the uh, nuts and bolts of Bob's paper, but what, what I'm trying to demonstrate is that the effects of niacin uh, on the cellular machinery that regulate the heat shock response are pretty, are pretty significant, okay? So uh, back to the gut, I think, I think leaky gut can explain a variety of things. And again, I didn't have time to talk about ketosis and offbeat events and fatty liver, but uh, I think there's a variety of things in, in animal agriculture associated um, with leaky gut. And in, in large part, it's just due to stress. So the stress umbrella that we've been, we've been developing in, in our group where you have these, these different stressors and um, causing reduced feed intake. And this reduced feed intake is just only part of the problem. The other part is this leaky gut induced immune activation and then nutrients being utilized that would otherwise have gone to making of milk or a fetus or a muscle, okay? So um, nearing the end here, heat stress cost, uh, it decreases almost every metric of productivity and profitability. And it's not just a you know, large or a small dairy farmer um, issue, it costs everyone in the industry. Uh, reduced feed intake is only a small portion of the problem. There's this heat-induced leaky gut. And essentially, the biological consequences of heat stress are, are incredibly similar to just simply other immune activations, mastitis, mentritis, et cetera. From a dairy producer's perspective, heat stress abatement is, is by far the, should be their biggest priority. And once they've invested in then these um, infrastructural changes, Dietary strategies, I think, are also um, a good strategy to minimize negative consequences of heat stress. Um, the USDA has been very good to us, and uh, this is my team. I have a team of rock stars, and um, they do all the work and, and, and collaborators. So I, I, hope, I hope you found the hour here useful, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Thank you, Lance. Um, before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief 30 second video with everyone. And then we'll be right back after that and we'll start answering the questions that were submitted uh, during today's uh, session. The heat of summer is coming and it can have a big impact on your cows. Niacer, Precision Release Niacin, is the perfect complement to traditional heat abatement strategies to help keep her cool from the inside. Using Balcom's proprietary encapsulation process, Niacer delivers eight times more bioavailability than raw niacin, leading to an increase in sweating and vasodilation to reduce internal body temperature and support maximum productivity. Learn more at balcomanh.com cool and keep her cool from the inside. Uh, Dr. Bumgard, um, our first question is, if you were implementing a cooling system on a dairy and you could only do one project at a time, where would you put your first priority? Mm. Yeah, so I'm gonna, you know, I've heard, I've heard uh, you know, Bob Collier and John Smith been asked this question many times, and I'm just gonna essentially regurgitate what, what I've heard them respond. 
you know, first is, is making sure there's plenty of water, access to clean water. And, and this is probably the cheapest thing you could do is just throw the grandkids out and make sure you clean the water tanks, right? Second one would be uh, shade, preventing that solar radiation. And then the third is utilizing evaporative cooling with fans. All right, excellent. Next question, with regard to heat stress and LPS, how significant does a bout of heat stress need to be to initiate the response? For example, if a group of cows experience heat stress during the day, but it cools off at night, will that initiate leaky gut or does it require a more prolonged exposure? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna allow productivity to help guide my, my, my response here. Um, if a cow is able to cool off at night and, and eliminate all the heat that she was accumulating during the day, uh, the effects on, on, on milk yield seem to be pretty small. And all you need to do is go to visit some dairy farms in, in New Mexico versus Arizona and, and look at the infrastructures and, and, and the amount of money invested into different dairies uh, to know that, right? And um, so it cools down much better in, in New Mexico than it does Arizona. So yeah, there, the question's hard to answer. Uh, you know, how many hours of accumulated heat is required? Because of course you have cows that are acclimated and not blah, blah, blah. But if they're able to get rid of that heat and start the next day with their body temperature back to normal, they, they seem to really tolerate uh, heat stress pretty well. So the amount of heat required to cause this, this leaky gut must be some type of like, um, you know, 24 hours, 36 hours, but it's a good question. All right, very well. Let me see if I can get the gist of this next question. Is there a level of leaky gut? Question mark. For instance, a level where only toxin can access the bloodstream and a level where bacteria access mm. the bloodstream. Now, that's a great question. And I suspect there is a continuum, right? And um, where the early stages of impaired intestinal integrity, you probably get the, the small products of of bacteria like LPS and other antigens. And then as the gut becomes more severely injured and the paracellular pathways become even uh, more and more open, then you'll, uh, you'll get larger molecules like entire bacteria getting in. It's a great question. I don't, I, I'm unable to give you a, a specific time or heat load, but I suspect there's that continuum where it's first and LPS, endotoxin, and then eventually whole bacteria. All right, thank you. Um, next question, where do you think the gut gets most of its energy from? Oxidation of VFAs? If so, can we feed the rumen better to potentially preserve gut function? Yeah, great question. And I think there is a, uh, again, there's a, um, of course, butyrate is a key energetic substrate for um, the rumen and for large intestine, butyrate's contribution as an energetic fuel source um, for the small intestine, I think would probably be uh, less than these other two segments, um, glutamate, glutamine, and, and um, glucose are also sources of energy for the small intestine. Um, you know, I, I think there's strategies um, at trying to maximize butyrate's contribution to energetics in the large intestine. Um, it's a hard question, and you're probably getting tired of me saying I don't know. <laughs> um, how to feed the rumen to maximize butyrate's contribution to the large, lower gut? You know, encapsulating it or providing a precursor to butyrate that reaches the, the large and small intestine, I think would there's potential value there. Good question. All right, I think we've got time here for a couple more. Lance, um, next question is valuable information regarding ev uh, energy metabolism in heat stress animals. As a primary nutrient, amino acids uh, metabolism also can be changed in heat stressed animals. 
do you have any data regarding the amino acids composition change, changes in the physiological status of heat stressed animals? Um, no, not really. Um, I'm going to extrapolate from, from other species. So the immune system uh, has a huge increase in glucose metabolism use, but it also has a huge increase in uh, amino acid requirement as well. And the issue with amino acid uh, metabolism during heat stress is that, the, so I, I didn't talk about the mobilization of skeletal muscle during an immune response, but they do. Animals will mobilize adipose, or sorry, skeletal muscle. But the amino acid profile of skeletal muscle is different than that of the acute phase proteins. And what, that's one of the big reasons why the uh, skeletal muscle is being mobilized to provide amino acids to the liver, for the liver to utilize those amino acids to make acute phase proteins. But the amino acid profile is different between the two. So the skeletal muscle is mobilized in excess of what's needed to make the acute phase protein. That's why blood urea nitrogen uh, markedly goes up. So I, I think there's opportunities for us as, a, as nutritionists to, um, to get a better understanding and, and be able to predict what that amino acid profile is and then thus feed to meet those requirements. And that's not just a heat stress thing. I think it's also a transition period, um, transition period issue as well. All right, uh, I'm mindful of our time here and I think we have uh, time for one more question. I do want to tell everyone that if your question was not answered today, we will be forwarding these to uh, Dr. Bumgard and he will answer them and then we'll make them available uh, on our website, uh, balchemnh.com slash real science. So last question, how many days slash weeks before the first heat wave arrives should we start feeding additives to help heat dissipation? Well, I think you definitely want, uh, you know, from a nutrition perspective to preemptively preemptively uh, get there before the heat wave gets there. Um, so if you're able to, it depends upon which supplement you're talking about probably. And, you know, the, the ball cam scientists probably have a better idea of how long niacin needs to be fed before you get the vasodilation effect. Um, Depending upon the supplement, if it's a if it's a gut issue, you know, some I would think you you want to have it preloaded before the heat arrives. Oh, yeah, I don't know, a week, five days. The problem is accurately predicting heat waves is, is difficult unless you live in Arizona where it's hot all summer, Texas, Florida. Um, but in the Midwest and Northeast, of course, we have heat waves. So um, it also depends upon the cost of the supplement and everything. So I, I'm not able to give you a good answer. In fact, I don't think I've answered a single question yet. I apologize for that. Uh, you've been awesome today, uh, Dr. Baumgard, and I want to thank you, and I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll forward them along with the unanswered questions from today's session. Remember, you can receive one ARPAS credit for today's webinar. A certificate of participation is available to download in the handouts tab on your control panel. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a follow-up email within 48 hours with a link to the recording of today's webinar that you can share with others within your organization. Links to past webinars are also available at balchemanh.com slash real science. Balkim is hosting webinars every Tuesday through the end of June. Our next webinar will feature Dr. Larry Chase from Cornell University who asked the question, how low can you go with dietary protein and dairy rations? Go to www.balkimanh.com slash real science and click on the registration button um, to get signed up. On behalf of Balkim and Dr. Bumgard, thank you for joining us today.